Hi, everyone. Welcome to True You Podcast, a storytelling space for self-discovery, where we use this safe and brave space to address racial trauma and healing for Black women through our own lived experiences. I'm Kelly, and this is my co-host. Hi, I'm Debbie, and we're a mother-daughter team having real conversations about real issues shared by and for Black women, because we have something to say. Yes, we do. Hi, everyone. Um, This is our first podcast in the new year, and I know um, we're towards the end of January, but I still want to say Happy New Year to everyone. Um, And Ma, how are you feeling today? I'm feeling really good. Um, It's been a wonderful start of the new year, so thank you. I'm great. And I am so energized and happy about our guest. Um, She's been a great friend of me for many, many years. And because of the sensitivity and the topic of this today's episode, we are going to keep our guest anonymous and she will go by the name of Monica. So welcome, Monica. How are you feeling today? Thank you for having me, Kelly and Miss Debbie. I am feeling very good. So thank you for having me. Yes, yes, anytime. And so today our topic is education and advocating for our black children in the school system. And this is a topic that hits very close to me because of some experiences that I have had personally with my sons. And I'm also happy to have Monica here because she's not only a parent, but she is also um, a principal in the education system and a former um, teacher. And so um, we are very excited to be able to discuss all perspectives on this topic. And so um, I'll open up um, with my own experiences and I can just begin by telling the story of um, a situation that I had um, where I needed to hold the sc- a school educator accountable. Um, and this was a, my, my, my two sons, they're, they're, um, older now, but this was around the time when my, my son was in the second grade. He was, um, going through school and I was receiving phone calls from the teacher about his behavior. And it was just constant phone calls. Um, and it was always about him not being able to sit down. He wasn't paying attention. Um, he couldn't keep, keep still. Um, and it was to the point where she called and she, um, she said that she felt like, um, he was not going, he shouldn't be able to, um, advance to the next grade. And so, um, my antennas went up immediately when, when I heard that, like, because, um, I was trying to figure out, okay, um, I know he's been having, you know, these behavior issues, but not to the point where he needs to be held back. Um, and I, I, I tried to like sit back and think about this. Um, and, and we had several conversations, but I would be at home working with, with my son on his homework and, um, different assignments that he had. And I knew like that he knew the work and that, um, he understood the work. And so, um, I had a conversation later with the teacher, um, explaining to her, um, that, I, I understand your concerns with him um, not being able to to sit still in the classroom. But my concern with that is that he can do the work. And so um, she was adamant about, well, I just don't think like I think if we advance him, he'll you know, it will be a disservice because um, he can't sit still. He can't do this. He can't do that. And so um, I was thankful because um um, my stepfather um, is actually a social worker, and I talked to him about the situation and with with my mom as well, and um, and they suggested that I take him to the doctor um, to see like if there was some other issues going on um, be- uh, first, and so um, I took him to the doctor, and the doctor suggested that I take him. She well, she gave me a referral to a, a um um. A, a, she wasn't, she was a social worker, but she could prescribe medicine. I'm not a psychiatrist or I think that a psychiatrist. And so, um, when I took him to the psychiatrist, um, she evaluated him. She had, um, worksheets, um, that I had to give to his teachers, um, to, to evaluate him as well. And then she, um, diagnosed him with ADHD. Um, and so after that, um, I asked for a meeting. And so I really got like a lot of pushback um, this entire time with trying to get a meeting with um, 
with the teacher, with the um, administrators, as far as um, trying to get him, because I wanted, ultimately, I wanted him to get an IEP, and IEP is an individualized education plan. Um, and so I learned about all this through my own research, through talking to my stepfather, um, and just trying to really um, advocate for my son, because I did not want him to be held back. Um, and so after we had, uh, when I when I went to the, <laughs> to the doctor, they were, they, they said, um, Oh, um, I, I thought that was it. Okay. I could get this, this IEP. And they, they were like, no, he needs to be evaluated first. I need like this paperwork. And, um, and so it was just really a struggle. Um, and, and I kind of felt that I was being disregarded, um, when it came to my son and, and what I wanted for him, which, which was not, necessarily special treatment but because I knew that well yes yeah, special treatment because I knew um that he could do this work um but I knew that he needed he needed help um when it came to medicine um that was a different story at the time um my husband at the time now my my husband at the time did not agree with um the medication that went along with ADHD and so um in that regard, we did not put him on medicine at that time. Um, so he, but so, um, he had, eventually he did get a plan. I was able to fight my way through that. Um, although he still struggled. Um, and I mean, he, he needed, he's, he still struggled as far as being able to focus, but, um, I was able to get him a plan where he was able to have more time to do his work. If he needed breaks, he can get up. Um, things like that. Um, but at the same time, it was also, um, it, it also took educating my son because he did not want to be singled out. So he didn't want to tell the teacher that he needed more time to do work. He didn't want to, even he would rush through his tests, even though, he, um, he needed more time because he didn't want to be singled out. And so the teachers, um, kind of had to help with that where like they would send them back like make sure make sure um you've read through these questions you finished really quickly you know so he could go back and 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 take his time um so I say all that to say that um I I, I felt alone in that process when it came to um it was I felt like it was me versus the, the school system and and the struggle that I had trying to fight to just get these accommodations for my son but I didn't but I felt supported in that I knew like my family was supporting me um when it came to to fighting for what was best for my son and I and I had I felt like I also had to fight in a way that um it showed that I cared about my son's education. Um, and I felt like the teachers kind of felt like, Oh, she doesn't care because I was, I was working. I couldn't come up to the school right away all the time. Um, and things like that. But I did want them to know, like, if there's an issue, call me, if there's an issue, email me, you know, I'm going to respond, but don't wait till an issue gets, you know, too far gone and then tell me after the fact. So, um, like, after, you know, he's almost at an F or <laughs> he can't come back from it. Let me know beforehand so I can work with him. And so um, that was my story um, from my own experience. And so, Ma, um, can you share an experience where you had to hold a, a school educator accountable? Oh, uh, yeah. I just want to share a little bit about um, uh, my daughter, how she um, had some problems in school. I wasn't real sure if she was just being slow or not trying. You know, for a long time, I just thought she wasn't trying. Um, she was very emotional. She would cry all the time whenever we tried to do homework. Spent a lot of money with uh, Sylvan and all these different organizations trying to help her uh, get to where she needed to be uh, with her education. Finally, you know, after spending all that money, I said, I'm just going to take her to the doctor. No, what happened was the teacher at the school told me to take her to the doctor and the doctor will test her. And so I took her to the doctor and the doctor said, no, she said the school will test her. Uh, I, you know, I will send whatever is necessary for them to do the testing. 
but the school is supposed to test your child. Um, that's what they're supposed to do. And then that's how they come up with the IEP and all that. And so this was her freshman year of high school. Now it took all the way to freshman year of high school to get to a point where my child finally got some help. No one else, you know, I didn't know where to go. I didn't know who to ask then. And uh, it took all the way up until her freshman year of high school to get the help she needed. Uh, she, the doctor, to, I, I asked them to test, I asked the school to test her in November. They didn't test her till February. <laughs> it took them until February to test her. But that was the best thing that could have happened because her, she had, she needed more time to take tests. She needed more time to do her homework. Um, and as a result of that, she ended up on the, um, on the honor roll that first semester. She just needed more time. And I was, I was frustrated because I'm thinking that she's just being lazy. I'm like, you can do this. You know this work. You can do it. And I'm like constantly on her. Finally, you know, taking her then to Sylvan and having them work with her, spent all that money with them and come to find out, should have just checked with the school in the first place or gone to the doctor. And so holding the school accountable, it wasn't a hard process in the beginning. It was once we got into those meetings, uh, they would have the meetings and then you're, you know, pushing and trying to make sure she continues to get what she needs. Uh, those IEP meetings, you never know who's going to be in the room. So I started bringing people with me because I, you know, I didn't understand all of this. So I had a psychiatrist come with me, so a good friend of ours who came and sat in the meetings. And so it's, you know, it's not that, you know, and for me, it wasn't that I wasn't a good parent. And I believe that's true for a lot of parents. They just don't know what they don't know. I didn't know what I didn't know. I just assumed she was, she just didn't want to do the schoolwork. And so that's my, my story about trying to hold these school, hold the school accountable. And since then, there have been so many different, um, so many different examples of that because of the work that I now do with um, your stepfather, uh, working with the kids in the community. Uh, that's what we do now. Um, mm -hmm. Monica, would you like to share something? Have you had an experience similar to that? Um, I, I, am, I can actually look at it from both lenses um, and just open some dialogue for um, parents that don't understand the process of going through IEPs. But my son was uh, third grade and the teacher had, um, was again, like Kelly was talking about, calls about behavior and not being able to sit down and things of that nature. Um, and it had got, she let it get to a point where things were out of control. So one day she called me, I, I, when I was in the classroom, I told my principal, um, I may need to leave. So I left my job and I went to the school and I just stood at the doorway because I wanted to see what he was actually doing. Um, he was up and out of his seat. He was chatting. He, he was doing pretty much everything she said. Um, so I had a talk with him. Um, we did take him to the doctor just because, just because I know the system, I knew the, the, the avenues to go. Um, the doctor did diagnose him with ADHD, um, which was fine. We chose not to put him on medicine. Um, going into, um, she was all about put him on medicine. And I said, no, that we were going to try some other things first. Um, lo and behold, he did get a, a 504. Um, he went to fourth grade. We moved to, we moved to a different school. Um, fourth grade teacher was very structured and he did absolutely fine. He has never been on medicine to this day. Um, However, like I can see still to this day that sometimes he does struggle with putting plans in place, um, following through on certain things. So we have to hold him accountable to different things. Um, however, if I had to give advice to any parent, I would say advocate for your child as both 
Um, Ms. Debbie and Kelly, you both did. You advocated for your child. And I know that sometimes it seems like it's taken forever um, to get what you need. There is a process that's in place that sometimes parents don't understand. Um, but once you give once you give the consent to go through testing, the school the school has 55 days to get that student tested before that next meeting happens. So there are deadlines that schools um, must adhere to. So um, Kelly, when you ask for that original 504 or that original IEP, a meeting should have taken place within 10 days. So there are things, again, if you're not a part of the school or you don't know someone that is, um, there are certain timelines that once you put a recommendation or you put a request in, the school has to ad adhere to unless you say, unless you give the agreement to say, no, you don't have to waive your 10 days. So those are some of the things that especially our black families need to know and to, to recognize that once you put that request in, once you once you ask for something, there is a timeline that starts and we need to adhere to. Yeah, thank you for saying that because yeah, I was denied and so I had with that particular school, I had to fight even after um, those initial meetings, I'm supposed to have yearly meetings like I would not have them, I'd have to ask for them. So it was just a, a um, terrible experience for me um, because when you're trying to make sure that your child is successful um, you want them to be able to have everything that they need and so um, mm -hmm. it was very frustrating um, during that time and so I'm glad that you you brought that up I, I guess we could go on to um, our second topic and so that is as black parents um, why is it that, I guess that, why do we feel like we're not as involved or, or that we don't care for our kids' education? And so I think as a black parent, like I felt, I really did feel like disregarded. I, um, I, I, I don't, I think in that school, it was majority um, black, but all the teachers were white. And so um, it was kind of like, um, I don't know, like, just take, just accept what I'm telling you and go about your business. And just accept that your child needs to stay back a grade. And um, that's just what's best. And when, when I said no, like, then that was an issue. Um, and so, I don't know. Um, Monica, um, do, you, do you feel, have you had that experience or do you have any comments as far as that? Absolutely. Um I can tell you just from this year, my son, who was a senior, I went to curriculum night and I talked to all of his teachers and said, hey, if you notice anything is off, please reach out to me. I've been, again, he has a 504. I've reached out to the counselor, talked to the counselor. If you notice anything is off, please reach out to me. His father and I, you know, care about him, what he's doing, blah, 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 blah. Come the end of the sem not the end of the semester, I went to parent teacher conferences. I talked to the teacher and I, I asked her, I said, I asked you at open house curriculum night if there was something off about my son or his grades to reach out to me. She said, Well, I did. I said, No, you didn't. My husband reached out to you. That's when you emailed back. I said, You did not put in the effort to contact us. That's a problem. At the end of the quarter, because at by that time, the grade was not where we wanted it to be, and it was he what he couldn't raise. It. I I will take full ownership of that. Mm -hmm. That was his choice. It was his doing. He has to live with the consequences. Um, I went to his counselor. Finals were over, and I went to his counselor. And through the conversation, because we had to change his schedule, and through the conversation, she said, oh, well, I have been talking to him about this class and this class. And I said, that's fine, but you've never reached out to his family. I said, because had you reached out to his family, 
we could have all been on the same page and we could have all eliminated this. That's not okay. Um, so in, in true fashion, um, she went into white fragility and tears started rolling. And I said, I'm not here to place blame. I'm here to correct the situation. This is done. It's over with. But how do we correct this from going forward? Because this can't happen again. And so she apologized and she was like, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I feel like I let him down. Well, we all let him down because this is not okay. And so like now she knows that I'm the parent. No, I'm not here with him every day. But I told her I work eight minutes away. You call me, I'll be here. But they're so used to us being problem parents that they're scared to call us. When I'm at work, I have teachers say, I'm scared to call this parent. Why? Mm -hmm. You get the facts, you tell them the facts, and you keep moving. But they're scared of us because they've never had to deal with us. Well, that's not my fault. I deal with y'all all the time, and I assimilate. So you need to assimilate to us. Because you have us in your class, right? Absolutely. So the problem is, is they're scared when we come and advocate. Because if I advocate for my children the way I'm talking to you now, they're scared. Don't be scared of me. I'm advocating for my child. And when we have, when, I don't, I don't know about you guys, but parents, go back to when they were in school and how people made them feel. And a lot of our black families feel like teachers talked down to them mm -hmm. and didn't want them around. And that, that could be very valid. So when they feel unwelcome or they feel that their voice is not heard or unwanted, they come in with a chip on their shoulder. So we have to take that into account. And I tell my teachers all the time, they're passionate for their kid. What they say is true. Kelly, how can somebody tell you that because your son is active that he should be held back? Well, what things did you put in place for him to see if he knew the information? So every day I go to school, I have some very unorthodox kids, hands down. I got one that takes a nap with me every day from 9 to 11. But I do what I do because nobody else is going to do it for them. Mm -hmm. Nobody else is going to talk to the parents the way I can talk to the parents. Nobody can talk to the kids the way I can talk to the kids. I can tell them, go sit down somewhere. They scared to do that. But I tell them all the time, you can't say, little Johnny, go sit down. That's not the way their mama talks to them. <laughs> Absolutely right. They mama tell them, Go get your stuff and go sit down and don't get up until I tell you to. And some kids need that. Some kids do need little Johnny, go sit down, they're going to sit down. But most of our kids, most of our black and brown kids, they're not going to adhere to that. So we got to meet them where they are. Yes. Right. There's not a one one size fits all when it comes to our kids. And and I definitely feel that. Thank you, Monica. Ma, do, do you have anything to say yeah, about absolutely. Yes, I do. Um, in, the, in what we do with, in the community, working with our young people, um, we have opportunity, we, we partner with uh, therapists. And what we've had opportunities to do is observe our kids, especially during the summer months, mm -hmm. and especially right after COVID hit. We had a whole year of students that never set foot in the classroom. And all they did, and they were expected to sit in front of a computer. Now these are ch kindergartners, so now they're going to first grade, and they're going to the classroom. And so during that summer, we had quite a few young people in our summer program who didn't know, did not understand, didn't didn't know how to interact, you know, in a classroom. So what I was doing was a program called uh, Edmentum and trying to get them up to speed for, for when they go to school in the fall. And there were two students 
that were not able to come up to speed. And so we have a therapist that we work with and I had them see the therapist, the therapist worked with them, said they need an IEP. So that student going to school in the fall had paperwork, going to class saying, and we also went with them to let them know, this is what we've observed. We've had this therapist test them. And so right off the back, these two children had help. The parents didn't know what to do. And it's because they don't know what they don't know. And so because we spent that time with those kids during the summer months and we realized that they weren't learning the way they, they weren't at the pace they should have been. And so today we're still walking with those two families. As a matter of fact, once, once we start working with the child, we take care of the entire family. And so the entire family is being cared for because uh, that's how you care for the child is when you care for the family. And so in talking with the parents, they don't, they're like, I'm, you know, I don't know. How do you know this? I don't know what to do. What do you mean? What does that mean? They don't understand things. And so we, we're like that middle person and we walk with them in it. It's not that they don't care. They don't know. And, and that's the, you know, and that's what we need to be able to do. Uh, in, in the ministry that we're doing, we're walking with that family. And so I'm just grateful that we're able to grow this ministry and, you know, walk with even more students. And so I don't, I don't believe that the parents don't care. They just don't know. Yeah. And I love that you're, you bring community in this because it does take a community to, to, bridge some, those gaps and so I love that you you're doing that um Monica um I know you spoke a little bit about um what parents can do and as an educator and an administrator um you talked about advocacy um but we don't want to assume people know what um the IEP process is and the 504 um if you can explain like the difference of of that and and if you can if you have any thoughts as far as special education um, and our black children, because um, there are disparities when it comes to that as well. So just wondering if you can share some of your thoughts on that. Um, well, I'll start with a 504. 504 is more for medical. So if something medical is happening that affects how your student is adversely being affected through academics. So if they have, um, for instance, they have ADHD and they need additional time, if they need the ability to take frequent breaks, if they need small group settings, they will get something called a 504. It's medically necessary for them to have these accommodations. However, an IEP is an individualized education plan that is something that comes with their cognitive development. So how they think is what the IEP is for. So they could get some of those same accommodations that a 504 has, but it's in an individualized education plan. The one thing that I always tell parents is um, when you go to a school, they're always going to talk to you about RTI, which is Response to Intervention or MTSS, with it, which is the same thing as RTI, just has a different name, multi-tiered um, support. And so that's where kids start. When we start to see that kids are having different behaviors, they're having different struggles academically, we start there. And then if it gets to a certain threshold, we go with a 504 and IEP. The one thing that I see most times, and I, parents give the most pushback is, they say, I don't want my kid late. I don't want them in this small room by themselves, um, with students that they they think like students have no arms or they're in wheelchairs or feeding tubes or things of that nature. Special ed is no longer that way. Most times they're in a co-taught room, meaning there's a special ed teacher and there's a gen ed teacher, and you don't know which one is which um, because they're helping all the kids. Um, a lot of kids, some kids know who has an IEP, some kids don't. Um, when I go in classrooms, I, I look to make sure that the special ed teacher is not just working with the students with IEP, but they're working with 
all students because they're all of our students. Um, even when our kids are in a self-contained classroom, they still get time with their gen ed peers. They're still going to specials with their gen ed peers. They're still going to lunch. We're mainstreaming them. And what that means is they spend a, a specific amount of time in their classroom, but then they go into, and I'm going to say first grade, they go into the first grade room to have time with their gen ed peers learning the gen ed curriculum. So it's not that they're in this little small room all by themselves all day long and they haven't seen anybody else. They're being pushed out to be with their other their other peers um, to get that social interaction, to get those academics that they need. We see a higher number of black and brown kids that are in that are being pushed into special ed. One, I look at it by generation. When we have our students, when we have our Caucasian students, we have to look at the generational education that they've received. They are, they are most times five generations beyond where we are. So what that means is their families have been going through colleges for five years. So great grandma went, grandpa went, grandma, grandma went, they have masters, PhDs and all of that. When we get to our black and brown families, sometimes it's their first time, like their parent graduated from high school or their mother just graduated from college. They're trying to make it. So grandma isn't sitting at home with them to teach them their ABCs, to give them that foundation. So when they come to school, they're already behind. So Sometimes we have to look at it and we have to say, are they just behind or is there a learning disability? Sometimes there really is a learning disability. And like Ms. Debbie was saying, that learning disability, when they're in kindergarten, first grade, you can easily tell that it's a learning disability because they're not picking up on those academics right away. Sometimes they just need to be exposed. And because our black and brown families, sometimes they're living check to check and they're so tired and exhausted, they don't have the time, they don't have the mental capacity when their children get home to do homework because they're thinking, how do I get a meal on the table? How do I keep the lights on? How do I keep the water going? So we have to look at all of those pieces when we talk about our black and brown community, getting IEPs, getting 504s compared to our other community. It's not equitable. And so we have to look at how do we make things equitable for our black and brown communities versus our Caucasian communities because it's not equitable and it's not going to be equitable when you look at how many generations our white counterparts have had educationally compared to our black and brown, if that makes sense. It makes perfect sense. Thank you, Monica. I'm going to get off my high horse. I'm sorry. Yes, no, no. It, I, I am very pleased with what you've shared because this, these are things that our, our listeners need to know about. You, you shared s several things today that I had no clue about, of course, um, sometimes it doesn't take much, but there's a lot, I mean, there are things that our parents need to know about. And so as you think about your experiences with your own children, um, is there anything that you would have done different as a parent? And, uh, what advice would you give other, give parents, um, regarding this situation. So Kelly, I'm going to ask you to go first. Yeah, I, w I would say don't give up on your kids. Um, fight for them. Um, I, if you have to do the research, get on the internet and do that research. Um, if you need to speak to other people, um, you know, find out who knows who and, and ask um, and, and try to get as much information as possible. Um, another advice I would give and what I did, I documented everything, every phone call I received, anything that happened in that school, I documented it. Um, if they wrote my kid up for anything, I asked to see those records because whether you know it or not, their records follow them. Um, 
so I, I I wanted to know what was going on in that school. I wanted those teachers to know that I am a parent that cares. Um, don't be afraid to call me, as was already mentioned. Um, I want to know what's going on. And I might not be able to hop up and get to the school because I work, you know, and then, at, you know, I, I was a single parent as well. But I cared. And so if I, I need to email you at 7, 8 o'clock at night when I had a moment, you know, it, um, I'll, I'll do that. So um, that's the advice that I would give to parents is to, to don't give up and fight for them. Fight for their success. Fight for their education. Um, don't take, um, um, if you, you don't agree with something, um, ask why. Don't be afraid to question. Um, and, and that would be the advice that I would give. How about you, Monica? Um, if I could do something different, um, I would just say continue to advocate. I'm still in the process. Um, so it's advocating for them regardless, going and sitting in classrooms. Um, you know, sometimes parents are a little weary. They sometimes parents are like, oh, you know what, this is what the teacher said. Um, and, you know, they'll say, well, I'm just going to listen to what the teacher said. And that's good. Don't get me wrong. But sometimes you need to go and you need to see it for yourself. So just making sure um, as the parent, you are going into the school, you are being visible. Um, people know your, they know your voice. They know who you are. Um and they know, you know what, she's not going to stand for that. Because some some individuals will treat your children a certain way if they know that you are not going to say anything, if that makes sense. If they know that, you know, I can do this and get away with it, and that those are just humans in general, not, you know, they're good teachers, they're bad teachers, um, um, as a as an administrator, um, things that I would do, I always, I wouldn't change this. I tell parents to advocate respectfully for their children. I don't care if we're on different sides of the aisle. Advocate respectfully for them because every child needs something different and the school may not see what you're seeing and that's okay, but let's advocate Let's come to the table. Let's figure it out together. Amen. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, I agree with both of you. You need to you need to be able to advocate for your child. And then there are those parents though that don't know how to advocate. Uh, there are resources in every community um, that's available to families. And if 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 you need help, you need to reach out to, to maybe the village or, or wherever uh, as far as advocating for your child because that's something that we do. We will go with the parent to the school. We as a organization advocating for our young people, we will uh, get a, a, a signature from the parent to say, it's okay for this person to speak on my behalf. I can't come. I'm at work I can't come and so that's what we do and 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 it's not because uh, we think we know better than anyone it's just that we've done the research and we know that we have therapists and people on our team that can help advocate for parents I remember sitting in a meeting one day with the superintendent of, of our um, really bothered me of our of our middle of our middle school our elementary schools and one student that I would one teacher I was using doing tutoring for our young people on Saturday indicated that our parents were lazy that's why our kids aren't learning and I say I pay I beg to differ if you you know why are you working with our children if you're not if you're working with our kids, you need to be working with the parents as well. And so needless to say, we don't, we didn't have her working with our kids anymore because that's not true. Our, our parents care. We spent too much time with our parents on Saturdays and Fridays 
hearing their stories, and I'm a spiritual director, and I listen to stories of things that they're going through, and it's hard. It's really hard for parents, and so we need to have, have some compassion as well. So our, our parents want to advocate. They just don't know what to do, and so that's why it's good to reach out and see what resources are there to help them along. And Miss Debbie, if I could piggyback, I heard you I heard you mention, you know, sometimes parents aren't available to come in person. And I really hope um, that districts are making meetings available to parents by telephone and by Zoom if they cannot be there in person. Because those meetings they can still participate in um, virtually. So I, I hope and I implore parents that Hey, if you can't be there in person, um, ask them, you know, can I have a Zoom or can I have a phone conference? Just because you can't be sitting at the table does not mean that you can't be sitting at the table. At the table. Amen. That's good. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Monica. And do they offer after hours as well? Because sometimes... Um that would be the only availability for some parents. That runs into some contractual things just because their work day is from this time to this time. So those after hours are really hard, um, but we do try to do the best that we can, whether it's starting the meeting at the beginning of the day or having it at the end of the day. It's just hard to pull all those people back together when they have families of their own and need to get their kids from daycare or need to get to sporting events. Yeah, thank you for that. And I think that's probably why it would, why it's having those options that your services offer, um, Ma, as well as like looking into maybe like doing like, cause I would go like during my lunch um, sometimes, and this was before, you know, we had Zoom and things like that. So I would be running during my lunch, you know, things like that. So it is a little bit easier, but just looking at every option um, when it comes to these meetings is important. So thank you for sharing that as well. Um, and so as we, we move to close out, something we always touch on in this podcast is identifying um, trauma and also, but not only the trauma and like what we've been through because um, you need to get past that trauma, but where, where do you go for that racial healing? And so Monica, um, can you share what is something that you feel the black community could focus on when it comes to healing when faced with these encounters and interactions? You need someone in your corner. I mean, Prayer first, because you need a lot of prayer in these situations. Um, but you need someone in your corner that looks like you. Because, again, a lot of people have gone through the educational system with white teachers that didn't believe in them. So when you get in a room, like Ms. Debbie was saying, when you get in a room and you are sitting at this table with eight white women that are telling you all the things that your black or brown child can't do, that's a trip. Yeah. So you need to have somebody in your corner that looks like you, that speaks like you, that can tell you the jargon that you need in order to get your child the services that you need. You need that person that can be your advocate and to teach you, no, this is what you say. Mike Kelly, if I would have known then what I know now, you wouldn't have waited two months to get what you needed for your child. Because now I know the lingo, I know what to say, I know what to do, and I know how to get those services. Yeah. And a lot of us don't know, and we let those people at the table tell us what to do, and they're using all kind of acronyms when they're talking, when they're giving testing results, they're saying, well, they're this is this, and they're this is this. And that's normal for them, and that's not normal for us. Yeah. So having someone with us that looks like us that can explain the process is the best thing that you can do. That you trust. Or having someone you, you really trust. 
Yes, absolutely. And it's not, and I, and I think the difference is it's not just one grade. This is throughout their entire, <laughs> their entire um, education. So from kindergarten through college, you know, um, they have this IEP or a 504 with them that carries over with them. And so each, but each teacher is different. So you have to go through a different process, maybe each and every year, you know, depending on the personality of the teacher, you might have to <laughs> start back from ground zero so it it is it is a lot of work and it and it's and it's trying on a lot of parents um and so I thank you for sharing that Monica like you definitely need someone in your corner um as you as you go through this process and so thank you for sharing that mm-hmm. you're welcome thank you uh, Monica it's so refreshing uh, to hear some of the things that you shared um, again if I had known back when my child was going through what she was going through then, what I know now, things would have been a lot easier for her. So thank you for, for what you've shared as well. Well, that does it for us for today. I want to thank all of you for listening. And I want to thank Monica. Wow, what a joy. Thank you so much for sharing all that you have today. It has been such, it's like a great burden has been lifted. Uh, I, I believe, oh yeah, definitely, for, for a lot of our, our, our listeners, we have people that listen and, and they wonder about these things. And so we thank you for sharing your heart. And thank you for um, all that you do and blessings on, on the rest of your school year as well. Thank you. God bless you all. God bless you. And uh, bye-bye. That's it for us. Bye, everyone. Bye. True You is brought to you by Radiant Vessels and sponsored by Proviso Partners for Health. Funds for True You, a storytelling space for self-discovery, were received from the Oak Park River Forest Community Foundation.